Hello again, everybody. This uh, video today is a very, very short one. Um, only some remarks about customs duties and wealth taxes. Because you remember, perhaps, we were um, busy with the explanation which taxes exist. And up to now, I introduced you to the um, tricks and tips well, the systematic background of value-added tax and other indirect taxes. Well, when it comes to indirect taxes, there should be um, necessary also a kind of excursus because it's not really an indirect tax, but also a tax combined or connected with goods, that is customs duties. And in these times, discussions about customs duties become more and more interesting. Um, because more and more, even the newspapers talk about um, negotiations over reductions of customs duties or areas where states renounce on customs duties um, levied on the trade between each other and such things. So, although it's not strictly a tax, you should have a basic idea. A customs duties is a levy on the importation of goods, um, which is demanded by a country if a good comes to the territory of that country. Um, at least that is the most frequent case of customs duty. It is in theory also possible and still legal that you levy a customs duty on exported goods. And in former times, it was even possible that a customs duty was levied on the goods which only transferred the territory of your country, so which were traveling through your country to another country. Um, such a customs duty on transferred goods is normally banned by the rules of the World Trade Organization. One has generally agreed that such a uh, customs duty levied on goods which only cross through a country that these things make um, goods too expensive but what is still customary is customs duties levied on imports or rarely on exported goods well so in theory every country has the right to demand customs duties on goods which come to that country's territory. Um, usually a country does not make use of that right um, for every kind of good, but they decide on which kind of good they want to levy customs duty on and which one not, on which one a high and on which one a low customs duty. That is the reason why usually you have in customs duties not only one tax rate. Um, no, on the opposite. There is usually a long list of individual goods and then there is an entry how high or how low the customs duty on such a good is. So not a single rate, but a set of rates and such a set of rates of tax rates is usually called a tariff. And that is the reason why one always talks about the customs tariff, not the customs tax rate. Well, um, the economic effect of demanding such a customs duty on imported goods is that goods from outside the country are artificially more made more expensive for inland customers than their competing goods from the inland. So if both countries can produce a good for costs of 200, um, then naturally for both goods, value added tax comes on top when it's sold, that makes no difference. But then the customs duty comes on top of the good which is imported. Let's say 50 euro customs duties come on top. Then naturally the good from abroad costs 250. So it's made artificially more expensive and that has the effect that customers are directed um, to buy in the inland. 
or that if you have very strong competitors from outside the country and your own industrial capacities are rather weak, then um, your own industry has a better chance in the market, although perhaps their quality or their cost situation is not as good as from the foreign competitors. So it has certain protective effects, or that's usually also the aim. You protect your home market against foreign imports. Um, well, that has, on the other side, some negative consequences. For example, the producers have difficulties to um, sell huge quantities of products. So economics of scale are rather limited because when you have covered most of your inland market and want to address foreign customers, then customs duties make yourself, no, your products more expensive than the products of your competitors. So your chances to expand production are relatively restricted. Um, and naturally, cross-border trade is rather hindered by that. So customs duties is officially acknowledged as being a trade barrier. Uh, now, when states want to liberalize international trade, and according to microeconomics and microeconomics and all the economics theories, um, reducing trade barriers is something very good for the development of the economy. So if states want to um, liberalize international trade, they will try to lower or remove customs barriers, customs duties. So trades very often negotiate that they are go willing to reduce tariffs on certain goods, but as customary in negotiations, they don't make concessions without that the other party also makes concessions. So in such negotiations usually it's well it's a deal we renounce on tariffs on the following goods and you renounce or reduce your tariffs on the following goods which we want to sell to your country so in the end individual suppliers from both countries profit from that because they can sell their products now for a lower and more realistic price to customers from abroad um, now, if you reduce customs duties um, and you have to negotiate with another state, then naturally you want to reduce your customs duties only from the, for the products sold or produced by the people from that other state and not worldwide. So um, that makes things sometimes complicated. Um, and very often, some countries really agree on removing nearly all customs duties between them, but they um, upheld their customs duties to the outside world and such a construction is a free trade area. So a free trade area is a treaty, no, is the area where the states in that area have agreed to renounce on practically all customs duties for all products which are traded between them, but they still retain the right to set customs duties individually for products coming from abroad. So a free trade area would mean from made up by A, B and C just means that A, B and C demand no customs duties anymore for all goods traded between them but that A, B and C still demand customs duties for products produced and sold coming in from countries D, E, F until Z. Naturally, um, if all these three countries, A, B and C, have different customs duties, which they have normally, then a certain product will cost 5% trade um, customs duty in land A, 10 in land B and 20 in land C. And naturally, if now between A, B and C trade barriers are no longer existent, then everybody who is interested in selling goods to country C would consequently import or carry these goods 
over the border of country A and then go on shifting them to country C. Um, that makes no sense because then country C would never have get its importation duties anymore. So a free trade area can only work for goods produced in the countries A, B and C. And if a good produced outside enters one of the countries, then transporting that good from A to C triggers customs duty on the border of country C, because otherwise country C could never uphold its own customs duties rules. So free trade area liberalizes trade, but only for the goods produced within these countries. Um, you can avoid that problem if you make an even closer agreement, a free trade area plus a complete harmonization or a completely uniform customs tariff law for everything from abroad. So that A, B and C still uphold tariffs, but no longer different tariffs so that our good from country Z or so is taxed with 20% or 10% in every country A, B, C, so that it does no longer matter if it crosses the border to the free trade area over the border of country A or B or C, then afterwards it can go on because it has been uh, taxed under the correct customs duty rate. So it makes no sense to dive, no, to, to, to choose another way of importation just to save taxes. In that case, one speaks of a customs union. For example, the EU is a customs union. Now, when um, UK left the European Union, they wanted to agree on a free trade area with the EU, and indeed that worked. They established one, but they were enormously surprised when they could not shift all goods across the border to the EU without paying taxes, because many goods were mostly consistent of material which were produced in countries outside of um, the E, no, outside of the EU and outside of the UK. And the rule is a free trade area will, <coughs> will never be extended to goods which are not produced in one of the two countries. So for all the goods which a British shop um, bought from an Asian shop or Asian factory and then wanted to sell on to a shop in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland or France, the free trade area rules would naturally not apply or better, the free trade area rules do not allow a renunciation on importation customs duties. So it's highly important to know where a product comes from, and if you live in a country where there is a free trade area or where there is a customs union. Um, in principle, all experts, all theoreticians are agreeing, no, all probably not, but the most important ones agree that trade barriers and therefore customs duties are a bad thing. So, there has already begun in the end of the 1940s a tendency to build back, to reduce customs duties and liberalize international trade more and more. But they choose a step-by-step -step approach mm -hmm. and it was set up an international agreement or a system of treaties which tried to um, establish the process how these things could be reduced over time. And um, that began with the general agreement on tariffs and trade. And later it was enlarged to a whole system of treaties on liberalization and the rules for the liberalization of international trade. That was the moment of birth of the World Trade Organization and its treaty network. Uh, that organization took up its work in the 1990s and um, it works relying on a set of rules, for example, that customs duties 
shall not be increased among the member states anymore, that a step-by-step -step, um, slow liberalization, so removal of customs duties more and more is the official aim of the organization's member states, that um, certain principles have to be followed. For example, if a state open up, opens up its market to foreign suppliers, that then all foreign suppliers from all member states of the WTO have the right to equal treatment. So if you want to reduce a customs duty, you have to reduce it with effect to suppliers from all other countries of the WTO, or you have to renounce on it. So if you want to go down from 10% to 8%, you have to offer 8% for all countries of the world, or you have to stick to 10%. The only allowed exceptions are the two which we mentioned, free trade area and customs union. So if two or three countries or more say, we do the big bang and we renounce on all customs duties which are relevant for trade between our countries, then you are not forced to apply the so-called most favored nations clause and apply that renunciation reduction letter to apply that reduction of tariffs to all other countries of the world too but these are the only two allowed exceptions so either you reduce customs duties in the same way to all suppliers from the outside world or you agree on a kind of big deal and say we agree, agree with another country that nearly or practically all customs duties which are relevant for trade between our two countries are completely wiped out. So that's allowed. And um, that's interesting to know these rules. That is one of the rules why you, for example, cannot say, well, we are going to um, levy still a high customs duty on products from a country which we like and um, we reduce customs duty on the same product to half of its former amount because we like another country more that is usually not possible but in detail there are many rules laid down in the treaties which govern the wto okay interesting because we speak about harmonization, standardization, cooperation. And so when it comes to levying customs duties, naturally you have to declare the goods which you import. And so that customs officials always know what's going on. So you have to do the right paperwork. And now imagine the container with goods is uh, transported by your enterprise through 10 countries, one after another until it's reached its point of destination. Then you would have to declare the contents of that container at every border according to the local um, rules, declaring and proving according to their rules where the goods are meant for and so on. So that would be a great a mass of paperwork and a heavy burden on international trade. So behind closed doors, behind what we and you see and what politicians realize, there is already created a strong harmonization for customs declaration. So specialized international organizations deal with the problem how the paperwork can be simplified. For example, how do you classify a good so that each customs official can categorize it easy and find it in its customs tariff and um, identify it. There is a combined nomenclature, so uh, generally harmonized system, how goods have to be classified into categories and how do you have, can determine what from the perspective of law it is, what you have in your containers and so what you have to declare. That makes life easier because what you have in your container is then categorized by all the customs rules in all the 10 countries which you cross under the same perspective. So you, if you can declare it as 
let's say serials at the first border it will also be serials at the second border and not have to be classified differently at least that is the usual case so even there international trade and internationalization makes it necessary to um, standardize things and make them even nearly uniform worldwide another tax which you probably remember is we had in our system taxes on income taxes on wealth and taxes on consume so you were taxed you are taxed when you get the money during the time when you have it and when you spend it and we have begun with the taxes on consume now let's turn to the taxes on wealth that would be defined as a tax where you at a regular point of time or in regular intervals have to pay a certain percentage of all the wealth you have naturally not only on cash and bank accounts but all the other kinds of property too you have to transform them by their market value into a money value so imagine that tax is um, one percent of the value of all your property on the 31st of december um, then the state has naturally a certain regular inflow in cash from that wealth tax the disadvantage is it's a huge amount of bureaucracy you have to make a kind of inventory for all the property you have you have to find out the proper market value on the 31st of december for all you have and um, people from the fiscal authorities have to check if you did not lie in your inventory and your um, valuation and well it only brings half a percent or one percent if you set higher rates then you stop the people from saving money and you give a strong incentive to waste it for example if you take a wealth tax of 10 percent each year then saving up 100 euro makes nearly no sense if you save 100 euro in october in january you have already lost 10 percent by the wealth tax now if uh, you wait a bit for next year then you lose again 9 euro again 10 percent of is left and so if you save up money for five years or so only half of it is left so people get a strong incentive to waste their money and that is the reason why you can probably only take a very small rate in a wealth tax now the problem there is a huge amount of costs from bureaucracy year after year combined with a very very slow and small return that makes these taxes highly unattractive more and more so many states have in the meantime abolished regular wealth taxes as the low tax rates which are possible economically do not justify the bureaucracy costs economy is probably more damaged by the costs than the revenue which is generated is positive for the state um, the other alternative which then is a real alternative is to tax wells not regularly but at only at extraordinary events for example after world war ii when germany was completely in ruins a kind of a high wealth tax was taken the so-called lastenausgleich uh, one could translate that as hmm, financial burden equalization tax so if some people lost everything they had during the war and others had luck and their houses were still standing then the idea was that those who had luck paid a tax of i don't know i can only now guess 20 or 30 percent of the wealth of their property which survived and by that money the others were supported to begin again um, the most frequent kind of an extraordinary event tax on wealth is the inheritance tax it's usually levied when a person dies and then everything you leave behind is taxed let's say with 30 or 50 percent um, the advantage of that approach is now all the bureaucracy pays 
because now you can collect high grades. The second thing is inheritance tax is rather a positive thing because, well, um, nobody gets an incentive to waste money to avoid inheritance tax. When I die, I have to part with my money under all circumstances. So I can keep all my money until I die. And when I die, I don't care what happens. Um, so keeping 100% of my money, saving million after million until the moment of death, that is nothing which I would avoid just because of the idea of the inheritance tax, which would um, apply after the time when it could affect me. And the people who inherit, well, if they still inherit 70%, they still can be lucky. So that is a tax which by its conception can work. Um, yeah, nevertheless, we are not going to talk about these taxes. They are not so important for businesses, um, at least not for business which are owned by a single family. More interesting are the, or the most interesting ones naturally, are the taxes on income. Um, and these taxes on income would be in Germany uh, mainly three different taxes. The first is income tax and the second corporation tax. And this is simply on a higher level the same kind of tax. Um, the only difference is, or the main difference, is income tax is levied from natural persons, so from humans. Whereas juridical persons is levied from juridical juridic corporation tax, sorry, is levied from juridical persons, that is from limited companies, GmbHs, AGs, um, European societies, and all these legal entities which only exist under the perspective of the law. Whereas, you know, human beings exist in nature, they are natural persons. A GmbH, an AG, a limited company only exists as a fiction of the law and is therefore a juridical person. Uh, and as there are some differences, there are two variants of the tax. To sum it up, income tax for natural persons, juridical person pays corporation tax. By the way, it's just a brutal error, which you always must avoid to think that every business pays corporation tax. Because a business never pays tax. A business is an object. And an object must have an owner. And the owner is a person. And that owner is either a natural person, that can be you or me, or it can be such a fictitious legal person, a juridical person like a GmbH. So a business never pays tax because of the business. Either a natural person pays income tax or GmbH pays corporation tax. Now in Germany, there has survived from the Middle Ages um, a tax on business owners alone, which is an additional tax. It's called the Gewerbesteuer, so-called trade tax. So surprisingly, and uh, probably not a very good idea. If you open a business and so perhaps even create new jobs, something which everybody urgently needs, then you, instead of the people who just save their money in a bank account, have to pay an extra tax in Germany, a trade tax. Um, the justification in the Middle Ages were, in the Middle Ages, business people were usually rich far richer than peasants, farmers, and other small inhabitants of a town. They were the only ones which really could make profit, and so they were viewed as rich and were taxed. Um, that tax survived as a tax levied by the cities, and later it was never removed because the cities had no other potential source of tax. Um, and so in the German present day income tax system, we still have two levels or two kinds of taxes, income or corporation tax for all income one has. And additionally, if you run a business, the trade tax on top, which is then paid to the city. Yeah, 
there are many tech facts to know if you deal with um, businesses, international relations, or want to know something about taxes, then you need to know some basic facts about income tax, corporation tax, and trade tax. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is something for the next video. For today, it should be enough, so I leave you alone with that last slide here, taxes on income, corporation tax, income tax, and trade tax. Don't dream of that, but keep it in mind. And I hope to see you again soon for the next part of this small lecture. Thanks and goodbye.